السلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعلموا أن فيكم رسول الله لو يطيعكم في كثير من الأمر لعنتم ولكن الله حبب إليكم الإيمان وزينه, ويز وزينه في قلوبكم وكرها إليكم الكفر والفسوق والأسيان أولئك هم الراشدون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah in the beginning His blessed name for granting us this life and giving us the opportunity to represent Him and to be considered worthy to be tested with difficult tests and trials as I mentioned yesterday. And it requires effort, it requires much effort on our sides to achieve success. Life is about movement, life is about achieving success through transactions and suffering and struggling because it's a positive thing, it purifies us. People who are in the gym who look most fit are the ones who put on the most effort. But they do it intelligently. They don't excessively do it, they do it intelligently. They do just enough effort to maintain a movement, a trajectory that brings positive results. They don't overdo it because even when you lift weights in the gymnasium, in the fitness arena, if you overdo it, you break your muscles down and you actually become weaker. But it's gradual, it's systematic, it's consistent, persistent, and that's how you maintain a physical state. But that requires effort, as they say, no pain, no gain. That's the physical world. In the spiritual world, we have the same reality. If we don't consistently maintain our spiritual pathways, we don't maintain salah, we don't maintain vigilance, we don't maintain cognitive approaches to understanding life, where we reflect on the purpose of life, and if we don't constantly work in that direction, then our spirituality will also be weak. It's as simple as that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. And that's normal. So, unfortunately though, often we put a lot of time in the material pursuits and we forget the spiritual pursuits. Human beings are made up of two entities, material and spiritual. It's a fact, it's the truth. Any human being who ignores either side is an incomplete human being. Those who indulge in too much spirituality and they forego their material pursuits are not complete human beings. And those who are material and they forget their spiritual pursuits, they're also not complete human beings. It's just as simple as that. You have to maintain a pathway for both. That means we have to have a material pursuit. We have to go to work. We have to make a living. We have to pay our bills. We have to give charity. You know, We must produce good products. We must try to break the barriers of successes and produce quality materials in life and engineer things that make life more you know, simple or easy for that matter. Because that's the requirement. So for us to go to work and earn a living and start businesses and enterprises and make money and transact is ibadah, it's Islam. For me to go to university and study many years, maybe a decade or more to get my degree, it, it appears like it's a material pursuit. But it's actually ibadah, because material pursuit is ibadah. That when I do get a degree and I, and I achieve high standards of education, that is ibadah. On Judgment Day, Allah will ask me, I gave you this intellect, I gave you this intelligence. Did you not seek knowledge? Did you not learn it? Did you not have mastery of the fields that you're in? That is ibadah. So let us not think that, oh, I'm in university, I'm studying. You know, I'm very busy, I'm all the time very busy studying, you know, Allah doesn't like me to do that. No, Allah loves that. Never is there a moment when Allah is not in the picture. I remember when I was studying in my graduate studies and undergraduate studies, and I remember as I was studying every sentence, even mathematics, I was understanding Allah through His machinery. 
that even in my science classes, in molecular science classes, I used to debate with my teachers and say, wow, this is incredible. You know how the DNA polymerase works. It's incredible. And to them, it's, it's just the machinery. It's just nature, mother nature taking its course. Whereas to me, it's a lot taking its course. You know, Every day there's a sign from Allah, right? And you see it, and you appreciate it. But that's ibadah. Now I may be indulgent in molecular science, I may indulge in business, in technology, in computer science, or for that matter in carpentry, or in janitorial services. It's ibadah. All of this is ibadah. The question is, when we're doing it, what are we doing it for? So Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My life, my sacrifice, my death, everything, everything is for Allah. Then Allah says, now you've got it. But that means two sides have to be balanced. The material side has to be balanced. For those who just abstain from acquiring material successes in life, it's, if it's legitimate, no problem. But in the general rule, we cannot encourage people to abstain from material pursuits. It's a wrong attitude. We must encourage each other to attain material pursuits. We must encourage each other to attain high standards of material pursuits. That our levels of living should be sophisticated. Look, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam's period. His community was wealthier. The Muslims were wealthier. They were living in more opulent levels than Imam Ali alayhi salam's time. But Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam's time, there was a lot of poverty. There was much poverty at that time. But in our sixth Imam's time, our ninth, eighth Imam's time, you notice that there was a lot of wealth in the Muslim Ummah. So you notice our sixth Imam was living in a more higher status of existence. His, his, his standards were higher. People used to complain to him that how come you dress so well when your grandfather didn't dress this well. And the Imam replied, we live with the time. But the Imam never said, oh, how terrible the community is that we become so materially progressive. Wrong. If material progression is wrong, then Suleiman should not have been a prophet. But there was no person more progressive materially than Suleiman For his wealth was incomprehensible today. And the palace that he had had floors made of glass, which you can't even do today. It's too expensive. Today to put glass someplace is very expensive. You know, it's not cheap. So imagine to have an entire floor made of glass. But why did Sulaiman have that? Allah is showing us a lesson that whether you are rich like Sulaiman or poor like Ayyub, Islam is within these parameters. And your pursuit is not for the material as the goal, but it's a means to a goal. And if we Muslims do not acquire the wealth, how are we going to move societies and communities? How are we going to give charity? How are we going to eradicate poverty? How are we going to elevate the standards of living if we don't do that? So Allah has blessed us with two capacities and says, nurture both. That's the human balance. You'll find people who become extremely spiritual, they forego the material pursuits, and that's not necessarily wrong. Maybe they have no desire for that. We can't force it on them. But to generalize that therefore all of us should be living in poverty is a wrong attitude. But if an individual says, look, I'm satisfied with my rights, I'm satisfied with one dress, and I don't need the pursuit, no problem. Live it that way. You want to be all the time in the act of spiritual pursuits, ahlan wa sahlan, no problem. But we can't generalize that. Nor can an individual say there's no need for spirituality because I'm busy surviving with my material gains. Individuals who do that are empty. <coughs> People who have achieved great wealth and foregone and let go of the spiritual pursuits, you notice they're empty people. They're empty vessels. They've got grand homes, but they're empty. You look at them, there's a void in their lives. There's a void in their eyes, there's a void in their hearts. You see it. I've, I've met many extremely wealthy people, and they've told me verbatim with their own tongues that, brother, we wish we had what you have. We have all this wealth, but we feel an emptiness. How many homes can we buy? How many jets can we buy? How many cars can we own? We get tired. It gets old after a while. It just becomes a toy after a while. But when there's no spiritual satisfaction within the soul, then what is the use of all this wealth? And Allah has engineered a system for us that we are hardwired that when we become charitable, 
and we take the wealth that we've earned and we alleviate the problems of others, you'll find the greatest spiritual satisfaction is when we do that. You see? Allah says they give charity in good times and in bad times. Allah says, The risk we've given them, they spend. Why? Allah says, I've hardwired you that the more you spend towards charity, in, in taking care of others, in bringing social justice, the happier you will be. That while you're busy causing balances in the world, you will become the most balanced individual in the world. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So life is of two components, material and spiritual. This blessed month of Ramadan helps us to attain the spiritual aspect of it. It teaches us how to attain spiritual standards, higher standards of spirituality. Hence abstinence, abstaining from eating and drinking and abstaining from the regular pleasures of the world. Allah wants us to realize our obligations in what we need to do to achieve higher spiritual standards. And spiritual standards are extremely important. If you compare the two, spiritual standards are actually higher. Higher than material. Material is important, don't get me wrong. But the spiritual standards are higher. Because spiritual standards are built with intentions, with vision, with purpose. And it has more of an eternity. For material things will fade and they will perish. But spiritual pursuits don't perish. They have an eternity factor. They're non-material. Even in the world of science you'll be told that if you want to move at the speed of light, you should be massless, materialless. And the less material you have, the faster you move. And if you go with the theory of relativity, the faster you move, the closer you are to the speed of light, the less you age. It means you become eternal when you start moving at the speed of light. So you notice our souls and our spirits are materialless and they, they are with us eternally. And believe me, our souls, which is composed of two parts, ruh and nafs. Allah says, yes, alunak ani ruh, they ask you about ruh, right? It is in the amri rabbi, kuli ruh bin amri rabbi. It's in the command of God, and you know little about it. The ruh is that essence of life that Allah breathes into us, that gives us life. Then the other part of it is the nafs which is the one that transacts in the worldly manner. The one that has two sides to it. You see? The good and the evil side to it. And it flips. And it's constantly fighting itself to balance out. Because our self has a tendency to deviate. It's the nafs part that actually evolves. Nafs al-amara, nafs al-lawama, nafs al Three stages that the Quran speaks about. What are these three stages? You find it's the balancing point of the self. That while I look at the world, I need to create a balance in the world. Nothing is more important than the balance of my nafs. The balancing of my nafs is the ultimate. People ask me, what is Islam? I said, Islam teaches me how to be balanced. Islam does not teach me to eradicate the extremities. Islam teaches me to manage the extremities. Because the notion of the elimination of extremities is impossible. Such potentials are always here to stay. It's what Allah has created. The ability for you and I to be extremely wicked and wretched remains in our entire existence. It's impossible to eradicate it. Impossible. You can't do it. It's law of nature. What Islam teaches me is how to balance between the extremities. How to take those extremities and not to tip the balance, but to be balanced in between. Bilqis. This, the corollary to the word Islam, besides it being the religion of peace, what does peace actually mean? It means tranquility and balance. When you and I have balance, we bring harmony. And when we bring harmony, we bring pleasure. We bring eternal pleasure. You will notice that our spirits, our ruh, is as young as the day it was created. You and I could be a thousand years old. Our spirit is as young as the day it was created. It doesn't really age. It doesn't, honestly. You see an old man or a woman, very aged, 
just their body has aged, but their spirit is as young as the day they were born. The difference is over time they accumulated more data points. But the spirit is alive, vigilant, active, proactive, wants to exist forever, and it's as young as the day it was created. It's just our body ages within this frame of mass world of materials that we age. And Allah says, Allah الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ ضَعْفٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ ضَعْفٍ قُوَّةٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ قُوَّةٍ ضَعْفٍ وَشَيْبَةٍ يَخْلُقُوا مَا يَشَاءٍ He makes you weak, then He makes you strong, then He makes you weak and old, and He creates as He likes. This trajectory of movement, where you have this weak to strength to weak, is Allah's vision, is Allah's lesson upon us, telling us this world is transient, and that when you do reach the, strength, the stage of strength, maximize your life, take as much lesson and benefit from it, so that when you do become weak again, you get stronger over time with spirituality. <clears throat> that while your material pursuits will wane, when you grow old, you'll ask an old person, do you want that? He says, no. Why don't you? All the young ones want it. He says, been there, done that. I don't want it anymore. I'm tired. I'm ready to give it away. But what happened? He says, well, I'm seeing my body going towards my grave. And I'm realizing that now I'm being forced to question the integrity of my life. <clears throat> that while I was young and beautiful and sought after and agile, and capable of doing so many things, in a daredevil for that matter, that I had the least amount of concerns for my death. But now as my body starts to take control of me, that my agility is no longer the way it was, nor can I be as mobile as I was when I was young, I'm beginning to question the integrity of my life as to why did I come into existence. And that is why you will notice you go to any place of worship in any religion, you will see it's usually inhabited by the old generation. The young are rarely to be seen. Because the young are busy learning the secrets of life. And they are busy running towards the glitter of the world, beguiled and fooled in many ways. But because the older generation hasn't set up good standards for the young generation <clears throat> to take lesson from, hence they are left loose like wild creatures only to find themselves having achieved nothing with all their acquisitions because it ultimately the age takes over and the gray hair starts to dominate and the wrinkles start to take over and then you ask yourself, what was this all about? Sure, I had my transient pleasures, but it is all for me now to worry about my will as to who am I going to bequeath all my wealth that I've accumulated. And Allah says, take a lesson. These are lessons, al-mal wal-banoon, zinatu al-hayat al-dunya, wal-baqiyat al-salihat, khayrun inda rabbika thawaban wa khayrun amala. Mal wal-banoon, your wealth and your families, are the beauty of this world. Zinatu al-hayat, it's zina, it's still beauty. And it's beautiful, its acquisition is beautiful. Us acquiring it is beautiful. Even Sulaiman had to let go of the wealth, it's beautiful. Allah doesn't say don't gain it. Allah doesn't say don't attract to it. No, it's wrong to say that. We should attract to it. And we should pursue it. But we should ask the question, why am I pursuing? When you and I go to the gym and work out and we want to flex our muscles and look good, we must ask the question, why do I want to look good? Sadly, many of us want to look good because on Friday nights we want to polish ourselves and go into wrong places and flex it. That's a wrong way to do it. Why don't you look good and be fit so you represent Islam well? So the world can admire you and look at you and say, wow, you're so fit and you're such clean face and your teeth are so white and you're so good looking. Not because you can pontificate and show off and say, no, I am trying to be a role model of Islam. We think when you're a role model in Islam, you should be dirty and filthy looking and very unhealthy because you're so busy doing salah all day. You know, we're so busy in the pursuits of the spirituality that we had no time to take a bath. We couldn't even comb our hair. Some people come in public places that you can tell what side they were sleeping on. Because <laughs> they didn't comb their hair. So why, why? Was, was so, were you so busy? You didn't know how to comb your hair? How about teeth? Do you know 
Dentists will tell you the first thing you see in a person when you meet them is their teeth. Second, their eyes. Third, their hair. Do you know that? Every time you and I meet each other, you watch, the first thing you'll see is people's teeth. You, it's just natural. The first thing you look at is a person's teeth. Now imagine if your teeth are not presentable, because you've been eating so much of that junk stuff, and your teeth has become brown, and you haven't even bothered to floss. Terrible, isn't it? That you may have the religion, but you're repulsive already. You think our prophets were like that? No, they were very magnetic. They were very clean. They had a beautiful aroma that no one could excuse themselves on judgment day that this prophet you sent was repulsive when he appeared in front of me, was scary looking. This is Islam, that the pursuit of our material perfection, they say the holy prophet never left the house without combing his hair. And he spent more money on perfume than he did on food. It was meager, but he still spent it. What was the money that he spent? To make sure he was magnetic. To make sure he was a good exemplary role model. Us Muslims, we should be extremely conscious of that. Not to the level of being very self-conscious, but conscious that my obligation in the world is that I must look elegant. I may be very poor. That doesn't mean you can't look elegant. You can be very poor, but you can still look neat and natty. <laughs> you can look very good. It's not about that, but that's the balance. You notice that at the nth level, Islam has jurisdictions and injunctions on how a Muslim should live in a Muslim. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Quick footnote, I know in the European countries, in American countries, mashallah, our youth tend to take care of themselves quite well. And I admire that when I see even our young brothers, as I mentioned the other day, instead of wasting your time playing dumb games on the internet and so on, go work out, go play some sport. Be healthy. You know, I always encourage our youth, don't go into the shisha parlor smoking at night and destroying your brain. Come out and go work out. Spend time in something positive. Go to the gym and work out. Have some sports together. Play soccer together. Play tennis together. It's healthy. It brings positive lifestyle. Our children should be encouraged to do those things. Today, our, as you say, our parks are disappearing. We've been living in concrete jungles, so our children have no place to go. And that's why they're so left in their homes, constantly having to play with these instruments that often are engineered by people who play with the minds of the youth and design them to be very vicious in their transactions of killing and butchering and playing dumb games. And then added to that, there are all kinds of innuendos that take you towards indecency. We must, we must protect our generations, right? Because Islam did not just come to entertain us with lip service, it came to teach us and that we must take our messengers and our imams correctly and to say, I want to follow in their pathways. The way our blessed imams work. It's interesting in public life when we become public speakers and we become well known, somehow we become royalty. Like we're some five star superstars walking around, you know. Like, yeah, you're such a star. When did our prophets ever have this stardom? When did our imams walk around with stardom? You know, with due respect, I'm a public speaker, I'll say this. It's an honor that as public speakers we are, we are, we are respected. It's an honor. It's Allah's honor. But should we bask in it? That we sit around pontificating on thrones like you bring me this, you get me this, oh, you, I want this. Who does this? Our messenger, when he was traveling one time, he did not tie his camel. He had already walked a distance. He stopped. And his companions watched him stop. He went back and he tied the camel. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, he could have asked us to do it. He said, it is not for a prophet to ask others to do his own work. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah. This is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Ali alayhi salam used to wake up during the day and work in the farm of a Jew and used to plant date trees. And the Jew used to come and wait at his door outside waiting for the blessed Imam to come out because he was so honored to have him as an employee. That akhlaq is what we should follow. The clarity, the purity of transactions at the base level, not to pontificate and walk around like we're some stars and we are superstars and we enter like people need our autographs. This to me is the Western idea of Hollywood, Bollywood, the Muawiyah styles. You know how Muawiyah used to walk? In Syria, he wouldn't walk. He had a, an army of youth carrying Bukhur. When the Bukhur would pass, then there'd be another small group passing, then Muawiyah would walk. 
So all his pathways was perfumed. I saw this in Mecca. When I was at the Kaaba, I saw a little Mu'awiyah walking. <laughs> and same thing, there was an army of youth walking with Bukhud. They pushed us all aside like we were animals. And then this high-nosed, you know, his nose was sticking in the air. He walked in and I looked and said, wow, modern Mu'awiyah. Modern Yazid. We have them all day. They come a dime a dozen. Right? You see that? That is not Islam. That royalty status is not Islam. Islam, in its truest form, is transaction on a day-to-day -day basis. Material, spiritual. Good balance between the two. Where I am materially acquiring, but I'm always talking about Allah. I have a spiritual goal, but I'm not an extremist. It's fun to go out and eat, and to play, and to laugh, and to joke, but all meaningful, and not derogatory where we bounce each other, and pounce each other in ethics. No. We respect each other, it's fun, we enjoy it, we go to sleep, we miss the day, we want more of it. That attitude is Islam. Allah in Surah Al-Hujurat says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ حَبَّلَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ Know that the Holy Prophet is among you. Why is Allah saying this? He's not only saying it then, he's saying it to you and me. That وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ الله. The Prophet is with you. He said, but he died 1400 years ago. Allah says, no, you send salam to him in every salah. Assalamu alaikum, ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa We send salam to him. Why do we send salam to him if he's not around us? Allah says, remind yourself, five times a day you're going to send salam to your Prophet because he's among you. And that reminder is what we're lacking as a Muslim ummah. We lack the reminding. We lack the understanding that this messenger is with us. He lives in our spirits. He is so powerful in our hearts that he directs us and drives us. He said, my best companions are yet to come, he said. They will love me so much, but they will never have seen me, nor will they have touched me. But they will live and die in their pursuit to be next to me, and they will think of me all the time in dhikr. The Prophet said this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salat ala Muhammad wa so you and I as Muslims, in this blessed, blessed month where we are fasting, we should say, why am I fasting? Who's my role model? When I was a teenager, I asked that question. I was so much dependent on friends. Every teenager's life number one priority is friends. They'll give up their parents for the sake of their friends. Trust me. These young, especially as the older they get, priority one is their friends. They will even lie to their parents to conform to the needs of their friends because they feel their entire identity lies in the conformity of their friends. Isn't that true? Tell me if I'm not speaking the truth. Huh? It's so true because I travel the world, I see it, I studied psychology, child psychology, you know this. It's nothing wrong to have that. But it's when we don't know what the balancing point is. When I was a teenager, it was the same. My friends were priority. They were more important to me than my parents. And if my parents ask me to do something, I always find an excuse to circumvent them to do something with my friends. Because at that time, nothing was more important than my friends. And over time, I asked Allah to guide me. Every time I went into dua and I would read, Oh Allah, guide me. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ حَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ ذَنْكَ رَحْمَةً Make me love you in your mercy. And don't let my heart deviate after you've guided me. Guide me, show me all my pursuits about music, about dating, about the value of parents, about the value of Islam. Every time I prayed to Allah, Allah showed me. He showed me with such clarity that I was stumped in life. I said, wow, this is so simple, so clear, how ignorant I was and how I fell for these bandwagon societies that we all have in the fad societies that we live in. The question I ask is, am I special from you? No. Every one of us is special. The question is, do you and I ask Allah? Often, we don't ask Allah correctly. Or when we do, we expect it magically to instantaneously respond. And that doesn't work that way. It works gradually, and Allah guides us gradually. So we must have the element of patience in our, in our lives. Otherwise, the guidance will not come. So when you and I pray, Allah guides us. 
And in my pursuits, I asked, because I was an avid music listener, and I said, if this is bad, show me why it's bad. What's wrong with it? And I pursued a journey in my life to experiment and to understand, and I realized it is dangerous. It's an instrument that does affect me psychologically. It affects me socially. It enables me to see things that I couldn't see, but it actually garbs it. It actually puts a facade on it that's not real. It gives me a false sense of perception. Now, every once in a while you want to play with it, you can sense it. And I, I went through that experimentation in my life. And I myself willfully walked away from music. And I said, no, I will listen to it when I consider it right, and what I consider right, and whatever I will listen to, I will ensure it doesn't take me away from Allah. Because this instrument is a powerful instrument. Music is a very powerful instrument. It's not holistically haram. It's not holistically bad. Don't get it wrong. Okay? Most of the music out there is holistically problematic. But some of it is extremely powerful. You cannot make a movie. In the, re in the movie world, it's impossible to make a movie without music. It's impossible. You can't have it. You need a dimension within this world, because remember, in the film industry, we don't have depth of perception. In videos, there is no depth of perception. When you see a picture also, you don't know how far that person is or how big that person is. You can take a very skinny person, and if you bring the camera lens very close, they look huge. And vice versa, a very huge person can look very small, because depth of perception doesn't exist in the world of film. But in reality, we have it. And we always have some sound and noise. In fact, people who buy those noise-canceling uh, you know, uh, headphones, they complain of headaches. You know why? Because it cancels all the sound, and the brain can't handle it. When you cancel all the sound, it sounds deafening. You can't handle it. Your head cannot function well. It needs a little sound. It needs a feeling of the environment. So when you study this, Allah is asking you and me, are you pursuing this balancing point? And many times when I was in Qom also, among the Maraji, I would ask them, why does the Quran not make it very clear? The rock, you know, and pop, and this kind of music is haram for you. Or so many beats per second is haram for you. Or this instrument is haram, but that's halal. Why, why don't you just make it clear? Why, why do we leave it in the gray area? And the answer for the fuqaha is to tell me, Allah wants you to struggle. That he wants you to understand the general principle. Lahw al-Hadith has been mentioned in the Quran. But are you willing to work towards understanding what is Lahw al-Hadith? Are you finding your own soul? Are you balancing it? And by you coming and asking us this question, and researching which will affect you, is what Allah wants from you. And I smiled and I said, Alhamdulillah, I understand it. I wish all of us would indulge a little bit, or at least we would share this research and knowledge so that we understand what to keep away from, so that we are not affected falsely and wrongly, because shaitan is vigilant in that aspect. And in my pursuits in the university years, I realized that my friends were really not that important. And I realized the reason they were important is because I lacked identity. I didn't know who I was. And the only way I knew was to bounce off myself with others. So my need for others and approval of others and the accolades of others and the praise of others was fundamentally essential for my survival. And therefore, if anybody didn't, if anybody didn't like me, I was brokenhearted. And that pursuit led me to question myself and say, who am I? Why am I so weak? I have wealth. I drive an expensive car that most people can't afford. <laughs> this is when I'm a teenager. I'm driving one of the most expensive cars in town. And I'm driving it. I have no problems with it, but I'm empty. I have the most expensive clothes. I am empty. I'm in the sports arena. I'm playing tennis for my school. I'm empty. I don't feel the completion. I have Islam. I have al Bayt, But I didn't take them for value. I used to come and listen to majlis, I would cry, I'd walk away like a ritual. Yeah, that's what we need to do. You know, on Fridays we turn on Islam. In Muharram we become good Muslims for 10 days, or 12 days, right? Ramadan, we put our business aside, 
we fast. We can't wait for eight days so we can start our crazy madness again. You know, this Islam comes in my way and it stops me from doing what I want for one month. Somebody says, when is Eid? I can't wait for it. Like Islam is a burden. Imam Zain al-Abidin is crying in Dua al wuda saying, Oh Allah, I am crying that this blessed month is leaving and I don't know if I will get it again. I don't know if I will experience it next year. But keep the spirits of it alive within me so that when I meet it next year, I'm ready to receive it even greater. Whereas our myopic ideology is, why, why can't we just let this religion pass? My friends don't pray five times a day. Why am I burdened to pray? Islam has burdened us with hijab. Our friends don't wear hijab. Why do we need to wear hijab? All these draconian laws that we see, that they're just inhibitive. We can't express it freely. Whereas Allah says, it's my mercy upon you that I'm teaching you this. That when I went to the university and in my room, I see one of my roommates smoking weed and cocaine and you know, snorting cocaine and drinking alcohol. And it was ugly to me. And my friend said, why is it ugly to you? Isn't that great? All of us are doing it. I said, it's ugly. Then I began to realize, wow, I took my religion for granted, but boy, was I prepared to receive it. In subtleties, but it just came like a ton of bricks on me and says, you thought your religion was a joke? You thought it was a cyclical engine? Now watch it act in perfection for your benefit. Then my, my friends would ask me, why aren't you dating? I said, my religion has taught me the dangers of this. And I can understand it. And thank God I have a family and parents who have taught me the dangers of this. That I understand the consequences because my roommate had a girlfriend every week. So I said to him, look, she was nice last week. What, what's wrong with her? But no, no, she's old. She's an old hat. I said, well, how many are you going to go through in life? All population? You'll never be happy. Isn't one satisfying? But look at this game of early dating. Even the University of Georgia has done studies to show that children, especially tweens, not teens, tweens, preteens, who indulge in dating, especially today our children have access. Click here for a good time. Click here and answer, you know, or click here if you think I'm cute. And there's a heart, broken heart, you know, a bright heart. You love me, you like me. Little children are indulging in these love relationships now. They don't know night from day what love means. They are busy now chasing opposite genders, right? Sadly, they have no idea what they're traversing on, which leads to all kinds of social problems in the future, that they cannot even maintain their marriages in the future because they've been so scarred. University of Georgia did studies that tweens who indulge in early dating don't perform well academically. And part of the reason is those who generally indulge in early dating are the ones who come from fractured families where fathers are missing or mothers and fathers are busy acquiring wealth and they've forgotten their children. And hence children don't know what to do so they go in the pursuits of that which media glamorizes today. And children now are attracted in that direction. What is it holistically due to our societies, it destroys us. It brings on bala after bala. That, the pro that now the probability of our children marrying good spouses, potential spouses, is reduced because our societies are not producing good potential spouses. So now it's even harder to get married. And what it does is those who do indulge in it find themselves with a rude awakening that they're not meant for each other and then it shatters. In the middle they have children and then the children become victims of this separation and now the children continue to the extent that they no longer have any hope in marriage. This cyclical, what I call uh, abyss that destroys us comes all because we haven't carefully managed our value. So me growing up, I realized that all these roommates of mine do all these things, what's my value? And it hit me like a ton of bricks realizing that subhanAllah, no one is more important to me than my parents. They're the ones who cared for me. They're the ones who helped me write. They're the ones who keep me on the right path. They're the ones who I'm afraid to do wrong. But of course it's Allah who sent them. Allah says, what was saying, al insan bi walidayh. We have enjoyed goodness upon you towards your parents. Be grateful to them. Be grateful to me. 
for what I've given you to your parents. How many times do we honor our parents? I get very emotional when I speak about this. Because at the heart, it's the same feeling, even greater, of Rasulullah. That when I assess my life, I said as a teenager, my friends were important. And yes, I learned. Alhamdulillah, I didn't do bad things. But I wasn't as respectful as I should have been. Maybe not even now. But I think about it. I said I was fooled, beguiled. And what could I have been doing in this world today had I seen the value of my parents? You all have parents. And many at times we're rude to them. We're harsh to them. But we don't give them credit that they deserve. And yet they maintain their vigilance towards us. And everything that they earn, they plan it for us. Do we really care? This young generation has been taught in the world today not to care. We use them as cheap carpets to wipe our dirty feet on and then we let go of them. Many a times parents are thrown after we get married because they're not important anymore. Our spouses are more important. Sure, our spouses are very important and we must deal with them with equity, but not at the cost of eliminating our parents. Quran is said, We have enjoined upon you mankind. You worship none other than Allah. This is the only verse in the Quran where Tawheed and parents are in one sentence without any break. And be good to your parents. Today, the world hasn't given much to its parents. I'm, I'm, I'm expressing this today because in this pursuit of balance of life, if I don't give credit and give value where it deserves, I'm an imbalanced individual. I'm not doing tawasul bil haq, nor am I doing tawasul bil sabr. So just a quick explanation that I realized over time that no one was more important to me than my parents. And as a teenager, I questioned myself. And growing up, and I said to myself, who is the most important person to me? And rationality told me, the one who will care the most for you. Because at the end of the day, the only reason you love your parents is because they love you. It's selfish. It's good selfishness, but it's selfish. None of us promise. When we say we love our parents, it's because they love us. If they didn't love us, we won't love them, though they are parents. Because we want to protect the self. So let's talk about this self. When Allah says, Alaykum and Fusakum, take care of yourselves. Ourselves is precious. And when we examine in the world today, you will notice people will backbite us. They will stab us. They will deny us our rights. But generally, the parents are the last ones to do that. Generally, parents will sacrifice their lives for us. So then Allah says, don't you think you should put importance to them? And my life changed, I promise you. This I speak with truth. My life changed, it took a different direction when I carefully assess that. People ask me, why are you doing what you're doing today? I said, I assessed the values of life. And I carefully placed my positions in a way where I realized what is really important to me. What is this transient world got to give me that will make me succeed for dunya wal akhirah? And I looked at myself and I assessed. I said, no one is more important to me than my parents. And Allah has blessed me with my parents. And no one cares for me like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one cares for me like that. No one cares for me like Ahlul Bayt. I know 100%. If I was with them in presence, or even now with the spirit of Mahdi alayhi salatu wa sallam, ta'ala farajai. I know for certain the Imam will do everything in his power to ensure my safety and security and my success. Hands down. Whether I'm in his presence or not in his presence, the Imam will take care of me. How do I know that? Because I know the system of God. The representatives of God do nothing but that. So let's align our authorities in the right order and let's take control of ourselves and identify ourselves carefully and take firm footing the way Allah says to Yahya, Ya Yahya, khudil kitab Oh Yahya, take the law 
by the authority and move and don't be afraid of the people. The people will learn to respect you and you will gain so much confidence with yaqeen that the world will follow you as a leader. And what will be the net result? You will bring harmony and justice in the world. You see? So Allah says, وَعَلَمْ وَأَتْمَ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ I assess that. And I said, no one is more important to me than the Prophet. So I am going to now move my life to what he likes. If he wants me to dress a certain way, that's the way I will dress. The way he lived is the way I want to live. I'm far from being good in that pathway. But as long as we set the goals in that direction and we work hard to move in that direction, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies us and gives us every prayer we go to sujood, Allah guides us. We say, Allah guide me here, He shows me. Guide me there, He shows me. In university, when I was debating Christians, atheists, all schools of thought in the Muslim Ummah, I was asking the question, how do I know my religion is right? How do I know Ahlul Bayt is right? I went down to the fundamental truths that I spoke about yesterday. And the basic truths that are essential were one to understand the rational world in the pursuit of perfection. If you and I want to pursue perfection, there are guidelines and rules and regulations. You violate that, you'll never get to perfection. For example, why do we say our Imams and Prophets are infallible? Often I get asked that question, especially people of the other schools of thought. How can you believe your Imams are infallible and they're perfect? That's absurd. I said, what is your goal in life? Is it not to pursue perfection? They said, yeah. I said, how can you? If the very means is not perfect. If the very means of guidance is not there, it's fractured, how am I ever going to achieve perfection? Isn't that what Shaitan wants us to do? To put hocus pocus leaders and then we band-aid them by saying, yeah, God will have mercy on them, like our Christian brethren will say, Paul killed Christians, but God is the best of forgivers. Huh? That idea? So you have bad leadership, so that we all fall like the piper and we go into the abyss because we think that's the guidance or should we attain perfection and we must demand that the means by which God guides us must be a perfect system otherwise I'm not interested in wasting my time if the atheist says I don't follow your religion because it appears imperfect I said no problem you have a valid reason but are you sure it's imperfect or have you wanted it to be imperfect because if you sit down and have a real conversation, intellectual conversation, you will see there is no imperfection in the system. The holistic system is perfect. And when we demand it, Quranically even tells us that this is how it is. The system of Allah, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا خَوَى وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْحَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى The Messenger does not err, nor does he make mistake, nor does he sin. No. Whatever he says is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every sentence and iota is within the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To that extent that Allah says, were this messenger to make one mistake, Allah will grab him and cut his jugular. Allah says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَا يُطِعْكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعْنِتُمْ Were he to listen to your whimsical suggestions, many things would go wrong. Proof that prophets are infallible and that they get guidance from Allah. They guide the people. The prophet does consult the people, but to help them in the in the art of consultation. But the ultimate decision is Allah and the Prophet. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the Hujurat. I mentioned yesterday if an evil doer comes to you, look all of this conversation, I gave you some basis of foundations. I stand up here after careful analysis. What is my value in life? What is religion? Why do I need this? Why do I believe in prophets? Why do I believe in the Quran? Believe me, it's a lifelong conversation. But I express a few snippets of it for you to get a little taste of my own personal experience. It may not be the best, but that's the best I can do in what I can give. But I hope it will invigorate, it will induce within our hearts to say, aha, I see, I'm going through similar relations, I'm going through similar trials, let me see if I can clarify it so that I can become more upright. And Allah says in the Quran, when an evildoer comes, validate. In our societies, if we have a system where we validate gossip, most gossipers will stop gossiping. I've had people call me with news. Did you know that person is saying bad things about you? I said, really? I said, why do you think he's saying? He said, oh, I don't think he likes you. I said, well, let's call him and ask him. 
says, no, 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 I'm just telling you privately, brother, what do you mean? You can't, you can't expose me. I said, well, if it's the truth, let's discuss it, because maybe you're right. And if you're right, we'll correct him. And if you're wrong, you'll correct yourself. No, 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 no. See, now all it takes is a little attempt to do that, and the person will think twice tomorrow in gossiping, in finding faults in others. We have to take vigilant steps to prevent that. If we don't, and we follow these wretched mechanisms, then it gives them more reason to continue to do it. Because if we keep doing it, and it works, when we do, for example, prank calls, and we make people go to the airport at midnight, you know, to go pick up a dozen poodles. This is what happened one time. This poor old man was called at midnight, says, your poodles have arrived. He never ordered poodles, but the guy didn't understand English, so he went to the airport waiting for some brother, thinking the brother is arrived. Now it appears funny, but imagine how painful it is if you examine holistically an individual who has the audacity to make such a phone call. It's a troublemaker. In A troublemaker has indulged in a transaction by thinking that he's young and this old man can't understand very well, so let me make fun of him because I've got nothing better to do. As they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We must stop that. How do we stop it? First, we must not do it. Because if we put alignment correctly, that Allah, the Messenger, our parents, our society, our obligations are within the right line, I swear to Allah we will not do it. We will hesitate and say, no, I can't do that. Because I don't want anybody calling me at midnight and troubling me, or putting shaving cream on my face when I'm sleeping. Kids love to do that. In camps, when we run our camps in Michigan at Camp Taha, this is one rule. I have a low tolerance for pranks. People say, why, brother, we're young, we're fun. I said, you want to have fun? There's a thousand ways to have fun, not with pranks. I'm sorry, I don't tolerate it. This is fitna. The Imam says, al-fitna ashaddu min al-qatr. Fitna is worse than murder. Don't do it. Because when you learn the art of belittling others through joking and fun, merrymaking, it'll become a habit to always bounce people on their characters. It's a bad habit. You can have a thousand fun. Not that. It's not prohibitive. It's a good attitude to say to our children, don't indulge in pranks. Why do kids indulge in pranks? Because they're idle-minded. They want to feel good, and they want to see the boundaries of social, social interaction. So they violate. So we must teach them. Allah says in the Quran, next, Fadlamina, look at this ayah that I just recited. Know that the Prophet is among you. Should he obey you in many a matter, you will fall into distress. But Allah has indeed faith to you. He has made Iman attractive. And he has made it seemingly in your hearts. And he has made hateful. He has made it distasteful for you. Unbelief, transgression, disobedience. These it is that are the followers of the right path. Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'ma, wallahu alimun hakim. A grace of Allah and a favor, and Allah is all knowing wise. I experienced that in my university. Every time I debate people, I see the fadlam min Allah. What a ni'ma God has given me. That while I'm speaking to Christians and, and Jews and of all faiths, I am just giving them my opinion. I believe such is the case. Can you counter me? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't. The more I realized, wow, I didn't realize that my religion is right. I thought my religion is just a religion among religions until Allah put me on the front lines and says, go test it. Go test it and see how great your pathway is. How much I have chosen you. I have chosen you among all these people with the guidance that my roommates, even my professors would say, where did you get that knowledge from? And I would smile and I'd say, my Quran has taught me. My prophet has taught me. My imams have taught me. You haven't got it, but I'm more than willing to teach you. That level of confidence grew in time which enabled me not only to keep away from the haram, but to also give me self-confidence that I no longer was dependent on friends and money and wealth and all these accolades from the world for me to consider myself somebody. Allah says, you are already somebody. The day I created you were somebody. The problem with you was you didn't take account of it. So let's end tonight's lecture with this accountability. Accountability. A man comes to Imam Jafar Sadiq and says that my neighbor prays a lot. He prays a lot. All day he's praying. What's his value on Judgment Day? The Imam asks him in Al-Kafi. He says, how much does he understand what he's doing? 
How much does he understand what he's doing? And the neighbor says, little. The man says, my neighbor knows little. He says, then his the reward is little. He says, but he prays all day. He says, his reward is little. So I say this to us all. We may be very ritual in Islam. We may be very practicing, constant. But if our understanding is little, then we will have a rude awakening on Judgment Day. For Allah will say, there is little reward for you. We say, Allah, all day I worship you. Allah says, what did you do with that mind of yours? Did you assess it? Did you practicalize it? Did you validate it? Did you value it? Or did you just do it because you inherited it? Unfortunately, many of our people in our communities, even in Islam, even among the Shia, we are ritual, cyclical. We don't evaluate. We don't value. And therefore, a little shining light comes someplace, even if shaitan has it lit, many of us fly in that direction. That is the danger of following religion without reflection and meditation. And I hope in this blessed month of Ramadan, we sit, even in the dark of the night, and we evaluate ourselves and say, Oh Allah, how important are you? How important is your Quran? How important is my life? And what am I needing to do for you? May Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah, to give us this blessed month of Ramadan, that every night, every day, while we're fasting, that all it takes is one sentence that may pass our ear, that may have a profound opening to our hearts, that will change us in the right direction. That moment is what we're begging for every day. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana khfir lana wa likhwanina al-lathina sabakuna bil-Iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lil-lathina amanu. Rabbana innaka ra'uf ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin karima. تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته